Друзья, я рад вас всех видеть здесь. No. Friends, I am very happy to see you at our uh, pre-course. You know, this idea originated a year ago when the guest, our guest was uh, Peter McIntyre. Uh, having seen us, uh, our attentive faces, uh, he decided uh, to conduct a course of postgraduate education in Moscow, and uh, he made everything uh, to compile the program and to invite the guests, our European experts, in order to exchange knowledge, uh, to exchange information. Unfortunately, he failed to attend himself because on the 1st of March in Kyoto there will be a large expert meeting he is supposed to attend. Nevertheless, uh, we got together. And uh, we will make, I, I hope we will conduct this course at a very high level. We have one more problem. Yuri Marley, one of the directors of the course, uh, sent uh, a letter uh, yesterday. She cannot arrive because uh, nurses and technicians went on strike in her hospital. and. Uh, uh, she uh, uh, couldn't uh, leave uh, the uh, clinic. Uh, well, that's also important information. We haven't yet uh, come across such things, uh, but this is also a certain stage of our education and preparation uh, for the uh, future. You see some social aspects also arise in our work, and I am happy uh, to introduce our experts. Uh, uh, who will make uh, presentations in the course of the day. I hope we will have uh, heated discussions on uh, uh, very different issues of gastroenterology. In the second half of the day, we will be joined by one more uh, director of the course, uh, Professor Khachkov, uh, chief oncologist uh, of uh, Moscow. I hope that we will have a very productive day. And uh, also our audience uh, will enlarge uh, because there are problems in the underground. Uh, uh, that's why um, many, some people will join us uh, later after the uh, jam uh, in the metro settles down. The course uh, will be conducted in uh, two languages. Russian speakers will speak Russian because we have a Russian-speaking audience. Our dear guests will speak English, uh, but there is simultaneous translation for those who are not uh, sure uh, of uh, their English. And we start our uh, program, and it is with great pleasure that I give the first floor to Tenis Miloslavic from Serbia. We have known each other for a long time. It is not the first time that Tomic is in uh, Moscow uh, at the, such a course uh, of uh, postgraduate education. And our first discussion uh, will be devoted uh, to the uh, as a fragile problems. And Tomic will tell us how to make best use of clinical guidelines in our clinical practice. So Tomic, you are welcome. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, to thank first to Dmitry Bordin for a kind invitation to participate in this postgraduate course organized by EAGN and Pancreatic Club and under the auspice of United European Gastroenterology. Of course, that I will try to answer to those questions regarding guidelines and uh, real life. We would like always to have a clear plan to diagnose and to cure disease, but more often, in real life, there is a diagnosis and successful management if we are lucky to be able successfully to manage disease in concrete, particular person. Clinician always must do his best to translate all available evidences to the management of individual person, and that is a real challenge. And I will speak a little bit about definitions and dilemmas, challenges, and to try finally to offer you some take home messages of this field. There is a very difficult uh, 
to offer you some cookbook how to implement in real life. And you know very well as a real life clinicians how demanding is that field, evidence-based medicine. Ten years ago in British Medical Journal organized kind of uh, online poll to do detect the most important medical breakthroughs and advances since the beginning of 20th of century, even mid of 19th century by now. And on those lists, sanitation was on the first place after this poll, and of course, anesthesia, antibiotics, DNA structure, but very high place on those list, on, on this list, was uh, evidence-based medicine. Why it is uh, so important in uh, real life? Because there is, uh, in fact, optimizing priority outcomes in everyday practice, and evidence-based medicine uh, means that current best evidences we implement in making decisions about the care of individual patient, individual person in everyday life. And we should always specify core components of that ambition to quantify priority outcomes regularly, to review outcomes regularly, to modify, of course, the goals and finally, at the end of the day, to have optimizing outcomes in our clinical work. And that is really real challenge, having in mind modern times and the plenty of publication and plenty of new information. And every day, about more than 2,000 articles are indexed in PubMed, for example. There is a plenty of information, and uh, it is, of course, not a black and white solution which of those information is uh, really practically possible to implement, which is uh, valuable, and uh, which of those information are not so high quality measures, but uh, uh, any, any, anyway, guidelines and practical guidelines is on a high place on the list of the uh, info on this published information among 2,000 every day. And when we analyze, for example, doubling time of medical infos, of medical knowledge, from the perspective of medical student, in 50s, that was almost 50 years time in which medical information accumulating and doubling. But next year, in 2020, medical student will have situation to doubling medical infos in less than three months. And it is really very demanding and very challenging for our profession. And when we are talking about the spectrum of evidence-based medicine, of course that we start with clinical research and with evidences, reviews, and uh, synthesis of practice experience in consensus statements. But even more challenging is how to implement evidence-based guidelines which are based on these practical experiences and accumulation of clinical research. And that means that medical education is an uh, ongoing activity for all lifetime activity from our perspective. Quality improvement is uh, one of the necessary pillars in creation of evidence-based medicine today. Clinical decision support is one of the practical results of all these activities, but the most challenging is how to implement this consensus based on evidences. And in the future, probably doctors going to be driving on autopilot. Even today, we have some very good practical examples that, for example, if you have uh, e-learning simulation and access to up-to-date in everyday practice, uh, on mobile devices, they are recently published that 50% uh, less medication errors are happening in a real clinical life. But in the same time, there is no doubt that there is a benefit of uh, anticoagulants in selected patients, but in uh, real life, only one third of patients are really uh, having this implementing. or. PPIs as a gastroprotection, in first year, our patients are having in uh, more than two-thirds, but in second year, only half of the patients are still receiving PPIs. 
despite we have very strong evidences and very clear definition in our clinical guidelines. What we expect by guideline, by these systematically developed statements with the goals to assist practitioner, to assist patient decisions about appropriate care for specific clinical situation, there is expected to, to facilitate more consistent, effective and efficient practice and finally to improve health outcomes. And what are the criteria for definition and ad the adoption and development of guidelines is, first of all, high prevalence of this disease or medical procedure, high associated costs, effects on premature mortality and avoidable morbidity. Also evidence is that medical care can make difference in outcome and the real knowledge that uh, there is a current variation in a, in a practice. And what we use as a methodology, first to target audiences and their use on guidelines, prioritizing topics for guideline development, then to guideline group composition and group process for creation of guideline, to involve consumers, to organize guideline group processes and to, to manage conflicts of interest in guideline development, which is very demanding in modern time. And uh, when we collect and to review evidences, communication and uh, translation, and after that dissemination of the guidelines, with the adoption and implementation, and after that, sustain, evaluate, and adjust. It is a very demanding process. In the same time, we have now one new kid on the, our clinical block. I mean, this new dimension of medical profession is uh, personalization of our therapy. And that was futuristic a couple of years ago, but now it is real life, this personalization of therapy, pharmacogenomics, etc. It is additional moment of demanding moment. And there is a very interesting publication in the last couple of years ago. They analyze what is happening, for example, in very, with very clear guidelines for hand hygiene. And the percentages of real implementation of very clear guidelines for hand hygiene in a medical practice, between 40 and 60 percent, there is a lot of arguments why they do not implement in 100 percent hand hygiene in everyday practice. And what are the barriers for implementation? First of all, organizational context and uh, practice environment, lack of reimbursement for some concrete step, risk of formal complaints, lack of time, patient expectation. Another group of reason is social context, including usual routines, opinion leaders not agreeing with evidences, for example, obsolete knowledge, advocacy by pharma industry, which is uh, one of the most dangerous conflict of interest, and also when we are talking about professional context, unnecessary test for regular symptoms, sense of competency, needs to do something, information overload, inability to apprise evidences, there are many obstacles in a real implementation. And I'd like to offer you some concrete dilemmas. For example, if you have a female patient, 48 years old with dyspepsia and breath test is positive, and now we have this challenging situation. Think about new Maastricht 5 consensus adopted and published and Maastricht Florence 4, which we are ready to use before Maastricht 5. And we decide, for example, in that moment to implement triple therapy, 10 days combination, AMO, claritrin, PPI, and probiotic, but we failed with eradication. And the clinical decision was to implement two weeks in accordance with Maastricht 5, quadruple therapy. But we decided to do endoscopy and histology a month after because of the first failure with triple therapy, despite the age of this concrete person was 48, not 55, because cutoff, you know very well, is 55 in accordance with guidelines in a concrete sense because of first failure and the fear of patient and after careful discussion, 
with this particular person, we decided to do on individual level something which is slightly different than guideline recommendation. Or another example, national guidelines recommends age above 50, once in two years, fecal immune test, if positive, colonoscopy, if negative, to repeat after two years, fecal immune test. And in a concrete patient, which is a 43 years old male without any complaints, but fear of disease without family data of an increased risk, and this fear of disease, of malignant disease, was very crucial in our plan, and we decided to perform total colonoscopy as a screening, despite fecal immune test was negative. And uh, that was kind of treatment of patients' fear. Is this the right decision? I'm sure that you would agree with me that this is concrete personalization on individual basis. And we decided to do, I mean, best for the patient. And a person, evidence-based interventions should be, of course, adapted to meet individual needs and uh, improve patient outcomes. And I mean that one of the key words in our everyday work is uh, communication. And I'd like to uh, just to remind you on this uh, Hollywood movie, Doctor, which is very interesting because there is a uh, experience by a medical professional. By doctor, he coughs a blood sample of growth removed for his throat, the biopsy come back, positive for cancer. And this famous cardiac surgeon should decide what to do with his disease, how to choose a uh, doctor who will operate him, and he did, and everything, and result was positive. But when he returns to work, he begins to teach new medical interns, putting them in a position to be two weeks patients and orders all the tests for them to feel the experience that they will soon put their patients through. And I think that that behavioral attitude in everyday practice is a very important in implementation, implementation of the guidelines in, a, in a real life. And communication is one of the keywords. We have many demands in everyday life, technology cannot restore our professional satisfaction, and uh, our profession will have to rebuild sense of teamwork, communi community, and uh, we should be together as human beings, and uh, spending more time with each other and with our patient, restoring some rituals, meaningful to both us and the people we care, that is perhaps the right direction for implementation of evidence-based medicine in everyday life. And I'd like, at the end, to offer you some take-home messages, how to change practice and to implement evidences. We should be prepared well and to involve relevant people in decision-making in preparation of, of evidence-based documents. And uh, we should have proposal for change, which is evidence-based, feasible and attractive. Study the main difficulties, select set of strategies and measures at different levels linked to the problem. And of course, to define indicators for measurement of success and to monitor progress continuously. Individualization of the management is not a result of eminence-based practice plus patient wish and expectation, but individualization must be with evidence-based approach. Pharmacogenomics is a, one of the best examples nowadays, and enjoy working on making patients care more effective, efficient, safe, and friendly. And I'd like now to offer you this grape harvest as a good example for a create guidelines and to implement evidences, common goal to make a good wine, consensus reached by the joint effort. There are key points in guidelines implementation. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Tomica. I'd like to uh, introduce my colleague, Professor uh, Hereshi from Hungary and Professor Bowen Tepish from Slovenia. Uh, friend, uh, professor Maria. and also Professor Lezan, the rector of Omsky Medical University, and Sergei Vladimirovich Morozov, who is going to present a clinical case. So the, we are open for discussion. 
lecture, maybe we should stress uh, another thing in implementing the guidelines. Uh, maybe the guidelines does not fit all uh, equally, like your case of dyspepsia. It's written in Maastricht guidelines that the, that the age limit can be changed according to the incidence of gastric cancer in a community. So the uh, age limit can be 55 in the United States, but maybe 40 in Serbia, Slovenia, Russia, and some Eastern European countries with a high incidence of gastric cancer. So the recommendations are not always strict. It can be adapted a little bit to the epidemiology situation in a certain country. What do you think about it? I fully agree with you, and I have a very concrete example. When we adopted national guidelines for helicobacter pylori eradication two years ago after Maastricht 5, we decide, decided on the national basis to have cut off 45 years. 45 years, even without alarm symptom, we do endoscopy after 45, based on the local evidences on the prevalences of gastric cancer and epeptic ulcer, which is not so strict 100% evidence-based, but that was our impression and some accumulation of evidence is that 45 is a more suitable. And I think that it is also very good matching with this uh, decreasing age for colorectal cancer screening from 50 to 45, based on the new evidences that every fourth new patient with colorectal cancer in Europe is younger than 50. And probably this 45 could be very suitable cutoff for upper and lower GI tract screening and eradication measures. Tom, it's an excellent presentation. You have mentioned that uh, uh, there are some uh, problems regarding the implementation of uh, guidelines in the everyday practice, such as uh, organizational, social, economical issues. But you have also mentioned that sometimes uh, pharmacological industry can block the implementation. Uh, can, can you give some, uh, some real example regarding this uh, pharmaceutical <laughs> blocking? <laughs> It is very difficult to have real evidences, <laughs> mostly on impressions. But maybe one of the, perhaps one of the biggest examples is, for example, these trends in the uh, 90s and bef before 2000 for eradicating Helicobacter pylori as a crucial step in fighting against peptic acid disease or simply to continue with H2 and PPIs. And that was kind of balancing and struggling, and, and at the end of the day, eradication is in first place. And, but I don't have uh, I, just impression and, and uh, nothing evidence-based in that sense. Thank you. Uh, so we have to move to the next presentation. Uh, Dear colleagues, today we are discussing the reflux disease, gastroesophageal reflux disease. И сейчас профессор Бурдин сделает доклад на тему эзофагиальной рефлюкса, рефлюксной болезни. There is a trend of gastroesophageal reflux disease that leads to Barrett esophagus and uh, esophageal carcinoma. And for that, uh, Illinois consensus was set up to prove the reflux disease as uh, a C and D uh, a reflux may be led to. And to confirm the reflux disease, we can uh, see different versions, including non-erosive reflux disease. Reflux is uh, a condition when the gastric content gets into the esophagus, um, impairing the quality of life of the patients and also leading to development of complications. These factors that uh, impair the quality of life should not be missed by the doctor. If a patient has only symptomatic reflux disease with itching, regurgitation, or chest pain that is caused by uh, reflux, um, makes the quality of life much worse and uh, remediating the symptoms, relieving the symptoms, we can therefore improve the quality of life. But if there is a reflux esophagitis, we can not only prevent the symptoms, but we can also uh, 
improve the condition of the patient and prevent development of severe conditions like Barrett esophagus and esophageal carcinoma. However, most of the patients with reflux do not have symptoms, but they still do not have any impairment of esophageal mucosa. Therefore, we need to prove the origin and the cause of the symptoms. And solving this problem with uh, regurgitation uh, and the symptoms which are very prevalent in the population may help improve the overall patient's condition. Uh, Professor Sehatubor, who is going to present now, and Professor Lazebny conducted their study showing that in Moscow as many as 23% of patients have some signs of um, reflux esoph esophagitis. And in, overall in Russia, there are 13% of patients have signs of gastroesophageal reflux disease, which was also demonstrated in a MEGRE study. Uh, many thousands of patients were questionnaired in, all, over the Russia, all over Russia. We have questioned uh, more than 6,000 of patients in outpatient practice, uh, which represent a huge patient cohort, uh, complained of some uh, symptoms of uh, gastroesophageal reflux. It can be explained by a life, a lifestyle and changed body mass index uh, which correlate with uh, hypochloric acid production as well as there are other factors that may lead to gastroesophageal reflux. This problem is uh, developing and however only in th every third patient we find esophageal erosions, uh, but in two-thirds it is just uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. If we fail to find any changes in the esophagus uh, except for uh, mild hyperemia, uh, the other patients are still remain open. Uh, some patients get to us uh, on PPIs, however, we do not know their initial condition, whether this was a, a true gastroesophageal reflux disease or just symptomatic condition. Uh, there was studies showing that those receiving uh, PPIs, when they stop doing it, with they withdrawn with PPI, may develop as either the buried esophagus or even esophageal carcinoma, but whether they initially had gastroesophageal reflux disease, this issue remains uh, open. There was a prompt endoscopy study showing no development of uh, patients' conditions uh, in both age groups below and above 50 years of age. Uh, esophageal strictures, Barrett esophagus are quite prevalent in both age groups. But let me uh, present you epidemiological uh, results uh, shown in uh, Spain. Reflux esophagitis in patients uh, who for their heartburn uh, had uh, uh, gastroendoscopy, uh, they were on PPIs in 50% of cases. Therefore, we cannot say that all of these patients had endoscopically negative disease. Perhaps they just developed uh, some effects of PPIs. And uh, PPIs did change the endoscopic picture of the esophagus. And although we know that uh, PPIs are not always effective, in the Moscow epidemiological study, it was demonstrated that 28% of uh, the uh, surveyed patients uh, reported of their heartburn uh, in stressful condition. Uh, the uh, acid production may in be increased in these patients, and reflux esophagitis is even more severe in these patients. And in half of the patients, placebo effect was quite uh, prevalent. That is to show that uh, hypersensitivity mechanism plays uh, one of the most important roles. And uh, uh, the symptoms are developed as a response to the, some functional condition. And uh, 
the symptoms are quite uh, functional. Well, as, as long as we find erosions in the esophagus, it, it, we see some risks for worsening of the patient's condition. But if we fail to treat the endoscopically negative forms, whether they should be GERD or functional heartburn. So the functional heartburn, per se, is a very uh, severe uh, problem. If there is no reflux, what can we do about it? This is the uh, diagnostic pathway of gastroesophageal reflux disease that is um, uh, officially uh, published as guidelines, but um, impedansometry is not always feasible, as well as other sophisticated methods of diagnostic. pH monitoring uh, may uh, con confirm a pathological reflux, and if there are association with clinical symptoms like it is one thing, but if there is no association, it is, uh, the situation is quite different. And therefore, we face uh, diagnostic problems. Sometimes patients do not meet uh, Leon's consensus uh, criteria, Leon consensus criteria. And what can we do with these patients? In real clinical uh, practice, if we fail to find anything in the esophagus, we just prescribe the patient's IPPs. And if uh, the heartburn is relieved, so then um, uh, we can use the Ronifas test that was proposed for PPI's effects. Later on, the Diamond study demonstrated the symptomatic response to PPI's is never a predictor to the gastroesophageal reflux disease because PPI's will help also for any type of heartburn. And Finally, we end up with problems with diagnostics. On one hand, the patients do not, might not have any organic changes, and the goal of the therapy uh, may be achieved on one hand, and, uh, but uh, it is not always so. We use alginate taste test in Russia with Jeviscone, and if uh, a single uptake of Jeviscone with 20 ml uh, led to the effect, then it, the test is positive. Alginate taste is still used in Russia, but as well as we do not see any changes in um, the esophagus, and if alginates help, then this is a, a reflux negative um, uh, disease. In 80% of cases, PPIs do work, but in uh, 10 to 20%, either the symptoms are not completely relieved, or the patients have to take antacids. The causes of poor efficacy of PPIs are quite very well known. Either uh, it is a poor compliance of patients, improperly chosen IPP, uh, uh, incorrect uh, timing of uh, the IPP uptake, and uh, there are other factors that uh, support or sustain the symptoms of heartburns and others. Some pathophysiological features that are based on uh, low production of acid, still uh, even in case of low production of acid, the symptoms can be sustained. Uh, there is also such an entity as a functional heartburn. With uh, other diseases, we have to uh, differ differentiate uh, the heartburn. Most of the patients have non-erosive reflux disease with their quality of life uh, much impaired. And there are also objective uh, obstacles of uh, proper diagnostics. Either the functional tests are not so informative, which uh, lead to uh, the deficit in uh, information. and. Uh, the problems of treatment with the standard dose of IPP are not always effective. These are the most important problems we face with GERD in our patients. And, uh, and now let us move to the real clinical case. Now, thank you very much for your attention. And um, the potential role of alginate uh, test uh, for the diagnosis, we know uh, that the PPI test uh, is not uh, not uh, really effective, relatively low sensitivity, specificity, and diagnostic accuracy. Do you have some data regarding the effectivity and the diagnostic accuracy of uh, alginate test? Mm, спасибо большое за вопрос. Действительно, мы 
Uh, thank you very much for your question. Uh, we studied alginates as a possible test uh, to diagnose GERD in real clinical practice. This is a very simple test. Uh, in a patient, when a, pe a patient feels heartburns, heartburn, they take alginates, but uh, uh, the uh, physiological ef effect of alginate uh, is uh, aimed at uh, re remediating the reflux itself. There was such a hypothesis that this is a very good method to diagnose GERD, and we conducted a study in patients with heartburn whether GERD was diagnosed later on or not. We did many tests, including pH monitoring, and uh, the patients who were later on diagnosed with GERD responded differently to alginate tests. And this study was repeated in the city of Omsk, resulting in a similar data. That's why we can use alginate tests in a real clinical practice. Presentation. I would just comment. Uh, in, uh, in our practice, the main reason if uh, patients adhere to PPI therapy and there's no improvement after that is that patients, in fact, does not have GERD or NERD, that he or she has functional heartburn. So without impedance and manometry, it's hard to come to that diagnosis. But it's a waste of time and waste of money to prolong PPI therapy for months if there is no response. This topic will be touched by Professor Morozov. <laughs> oh, I'm not Professor yet. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to comment that uh, really non-erosive gastroesophageal reflux disease is always diff and difficult to diagnose. And uh, uh, moreover, we need uh, recommendations. And always uh, these recommendations should be uh, evidence-based. But uh, when we are trying to perform studies uh, and uh, to uh, support the diagnosis of uh, non-erosive gastroesophageal reflux disease, uh, there are always a lot of questions. Uh, and uh, we do not have a uh, proper instrument, pro uh, probably, uh, to support it. And uh, even if we have uh, pH and pH studies, uh, uh, this uh, situation we uh, have uh, <coughs> We have experience with that uh, always uh, when uh, with, uh, we are trying to submit a paper, uh, we need to support this diagnosis. And even uh, if we have uh, different, uh, different instrumental methods, uh, if we have questionnaires, but uh, this is not a really good uh, instrument all, uh, also to support the diagnosis. Uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, do we need some uh, tool? Uh, to uh, support the diagnosis of non-erosive gastroesophageal reflux disease. And uh, uh, another point that uh, you talk uh, about uh, hypersensitivity, uh, do we need this uh, test also to um, perform on our patients, probably, uh, for hypersensitivity? Not alginate, not PPI, but probably uh, with other treatment like uh, antidepressants or something else, or uh, probably a uh, physiologic, uh, some study, instrument. What do you think? No, I absolutely agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. If we fail um, to diagnose the patient, we need to uh, diagnose the patients at individual level. Uh, we can uh, suspect that hypersensitivity may play a certain role in a development of symptoms, but if minimal reflux is uh, removed, so if it is uh, remediated, then a patient either has uh, uh, hypersensitivity as a leading mechanism of uh, the clinical picture or some other comorbidity. But it is hard to tell without uh, a special uh, functional tests, uh, including psychiatrists and a psychiatric tests, because there are no uh, absolute absolutely effective tests uh, to uh, diagnose hypersensitivity in our patients. Uh, maybe you, you maybe you have some experience with hypersensitivity. So it's very difficult. Probably will be your topic, and we can discuss uh, antidepressant therapy. Uh, it's an option, but uh, how does it work, and uh, the effectiveness is, is not not clear enough. Uh, uh, too many reasons for uh, ineffective uh, ineffectiveness of sure. PPI. So uh, <coughs> maybe we will move to your 
clinical presentation and discuss. I may have another question. According to Montreal classification and according to guidelines, uh, in a young patient with typical uh, symptoms, uh, the diagnosis should be based according to, it's, it's a symptom-based diagnosis. But in the real world, when do you perform in a young patient uh, endoscopy in, in Russia? What do you think? А, ну, это всегда большой вопрос. Вот здесь присутствует заведующий отделом. It's always a big issue. We have uh, the head of the department of endoscopy, uh, Kirill Shishin. He will make his uh, presentation. And for, fortunately, we have a very good department of endoscopy. We are on the third level of uh, providing medical care. If people reach us, that means that they have uh, covered a lot of stages, and we can make instrumental diagnostics, uh, uh, monometry of the uh, uh, esophagus. Uh, yeah, so uh, if we speak about the level of the outpatient department, uh, the situation is quite uh, different, uh, and there is no access to good uh, quality endoscopic uh, treatment um, there. But uh, mo most often we start with the PPI uh, on young patients. Uh, if it doesn't help, they go to the next uh, level uh, of uh, treatment. Uh, so the problem is the economic affordability of uh, diagno endoscopic diagnostics. Uh, Sergei Morozov uh, will present a clinical case, and we will discuss it. I think we will have to discuss it. Uh, I will speak Russian, but my slides are translated into English. That's why our colleagues, uh, we will uh, see it uh, on the screen in English. Uh, the well, Dmitry Stanislavovich, thank you very much. Uh, so I don't have to explain the inefficacy, uh, the reasons of inefficacy of PPI. Uh, I must say that most uh, patients uh, with the GERD uh, uh, the, 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 the first uh, line of therapy is here is the PPI, and they help. But in uh, some cases, uh, there are uh, still uh, patients we, which do not have uh, uh, sufficient effect uh, from PPI. And that's why we're showing such a case to you. It is a female patient who was directed to uh, referred to us. She was 33. Uh, Caucasian, and uh, uh, she complained of the heartburn after each uh, uh, me, uh, food intake, and also she had heartburn at night, uh, three, four times a week. Uh, so she uh, has uh, 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 belch, belch, belch in the belly. Uh, she had constipation. And she tried to fight uh, the symptoms. Uh, uh, she limited uh, uh, the food intake, and she reduced her weight by five kilos. And when we talked to her, she uh, showed anxiety. She was very much concerned, and she tried to understand uh, why her condition is uh, so severe from her point of view. And uh, that was also uh, specified by the previous experience of treatment. From the anamnesis, we knew uh, that she had had symptoms for five years. The first uh, symptoms uh, uh, appeared after she took antibacterial drugs uh, for the flu. And uh, uh, when the symptoms uh, appeared, she uh, used antisides uh, that uh, improved the situation for a very short period of time, but did not uh, uh, improve her condition uh, generally. So she uh, first applied to the outpatient department, to the therapist, and she was prescribed uh, PPIs as the most uh, omeprazole. <laughs> And uh, there was some effect, but the heartburn persisted. 
So we can't say what dose of PPIs was used at that time. Nevertheless, although the, since the heartburn persisted, she was referred to endoscopic uh, uh, test, and uh, it was also done in the uh, outpatient de um, department. It was so they found erosive uh, esophagitis and chronic gastritis. Uh, since uh, the patient uh, had a reduced weight, uh, she there was also an oncosearch uh, made, and uh, uh, oncological uh, diseases were excluded. Uh, then she uh, there was an ultrasound of her abdomen and the chest, but there were no pathology there. So she received a consultation from the psychotherapist, and since uh, because of her anxiety. Uh, she uh, received a denial, uh, but uh, without uh, um, we couldn't assess the effect. And August last year, she was referred to us because the therapy proved to be ineffective, and we were to decide what to do with this patient. Uh, the physical examination showed the reduced BMI. So she had anxiety, uh, but uh, uh, the uh, physical examination did not uh, see any deviations from the norm. So what do we have today? At this time, we know that the patient uh, has received uh, PPIs for her symptoms. There was partial effect, but a full effect was not reached. We know that the patient had erosive esophagitis, so GERD diagnosis exists. Uh, why PPI were ineffective and what issues we are uh, to solve when we have a patient with uh, such problems. First of all, we need to decide uh, GERD. Has this diagnosis been confirmed? Uh, did the, uh, and, uh, whether the, uh, the uh, drugs were used properly, did they provide a maximal effect? Uh, whether they, we should know whether the patient has been compliant uh, and uh, take, has taken the PPIs in accordance with the prescription. We need to assess uh, the possibility of a patient having an increased metabolism. Uh, we know that the uh, European population has many patients uh, with increased metabolism for uh, PPI by cytochrome. We also have to exclude other problems. Uh, if we uh, face uh, the acid, probably there had been some other uh, agents used, and say NSAIDs for alcohol and other destroying agents. Whether there are indications for the surgery. We also need to exclude other reasonable symptoms such as spasms, uh, the erosive uh, uh, esophagitis that can hide sometimes the systems of GERD. And uh, also, we need uh, to make uh, to use instrumental methods to prove the relationship uh, between the symptoms uh, possessed by the patient and uh, the uh, gastroesophageal reflex that can uh, help us uh, to uh, prescribe adequate therapy and finally when we say that GERD is really resistant uh, to PPIs. Uh, so this question has been discussed quite widely in literature. And if we look at our data, we will see that in 2018, there was an article published uh, that uh, uh, advises to use uh, uh, criteria saying that symptoms are to be preserved on standard doses for eight weeks. Nevertheless, if we look at foreign data, uh, they say that uh, uh, refractory 
symptoms of GERD, heartburn or regurgitation, are to remain despite double doses of PPAIs for at least three months. So, uh, as to our patient, uh, we comply with both criteria because our Russian criteria are even weaker. So, the patient took anti-secretary drugs for a long time, for more than three months, and they remained ineffective. We excluded other destroying factors, for example, the use of NSAIDs. The patient didn't use them. She doesn't smoke. Uh, she doesn't use, use any uh, biologically active uh, uh, supplements. Uh, the pregnancy test was negative. What other tests were made? Here you see the results uh, of the X-ray test uh, of uh, the stomach. Uh, you see there were there were um, uh, symptoms of uh, duodenitis, uh, gastritis. Uh, 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 Helicobacter pylori was positive. Uh, then we had uh, the test with lactulose, and uh, so there was an showed an excessive excessive growth of hydrogen producing uh, flora. Uh, so there was also a, a hiatus uh, uh, hernia and normal uh, maturity of the uh, esophagus. So here you see the results of PH uh, uh, impedance uh, monitoring. Here you see the reflux, the yellow field is the time when the patient pressed the button if for two minutes uh, the patient uh, before, uh, it has a reflux uh, before the symptom. We can speak about such a relationship. And this is, you see, 24 hours as a fragile pH impedance uh, uh, results. So it was, it was uh, made only for 13 hours. So uh, part of the uh, material was lost. Uh, and here you see uh, 55 uh, reflexes registers for at meal, uh, and analyzed were 51. Uh, among them are five acid, 41 weak acid, five non acid. Uh, I forgot to say that the test was made. Uh, during the therapy of PPIs uh, to assess uh, their efficacy and the relationship of symptoms. So uh, a large number of reflexes reached the first one-third of the uh, esophagus, and the mean gastric pH proved to be 4.3. Uh, and the uh, patient marked 11 symptoms on tracing. Six of them were associated with GERS. So it shows the relationship between the reflux and the symptoms. Uh, so we may say that the GERD diagnosis is established, but what is uh, the treatment for such patients? What we are supposed to do? Uh, first of all, uh, she was uh, provided with treatment to eradicate uh, Helicobacter uh, pylori infection in order to use uh, PPIs for a long period of time. Concomitant uh, medications were the same. It was sulpirid, antacids, after meal, when the patient suffered from heartburn, also to resolve belching, uh, so Sikikom was used to reduce these symptoms and to correct uh, the uh, food uh, status, uh, so enteral uh, feeding was used. She was prescribed omeprazole, uh, 40 milligrams uh, twice a day uh, before meal, and then uh, the examination was to be done three uh, uh, months, and it was December 2018. We uh, noted that 
uh, that she gained weight. Uh, she experienced uh, still heartburn, but uh, she noted uh, that the character of the symptom had uh, changed. Uh, she cannot describe it, uh, uh, but she feels it differently now. She still experienced bloating almost every day. She continued azomeprazole uh, before a meal, and uh, she didn't miss uh, uh, the medicine intake, uh, and she used it constantly. By the uh, upper, GI, upper GI endoscopy showed that there were uh, no inflammation, but there were signs of hiatal hernia. Uh, as to Helicobacter pylori, the result was negative. And the lactulose uh, breath uh, test uh, showed that uh, there were still some signs uh, of excessive uh, bacterial growth uh, in the uh, small uh, intestine. Here we see the results of pH impedance uh, monitoring, uh, and it showed that the levels uh, of oxidation in the uh, esophagus were minimal. Most of the time, they, uh, were, they had neutral uh, indicators. So the mean esophageal pH was 6.5, and mean intragastric pH was 5.4. But uh, all symptoms, most of the symptoms were associated with GERs. So what we did further, we uh, continued azomeprazole in the same dose, and uh, we, consult, we got a consultation from psychotherapist. Uh, and, uh, since the drug that had been prescribed before was ineffective, it was replaced uh, by fluoxetin. And uh, in peril, uh, to improve uh, the successive uh, bacterial growth, uh, so the drug was used. A month later, uh, she uh, uh, came uh, this year for an examination. And uh, she uh, noted that for the last seven days, she had not had any heartburn. Uh, there was no bloating. Uh, she expanded her diet, and she feels much more optimistic. So what uh, does uh, the situation uh, tell us? Uh, probably we will have some discussion, Dmitry Stanislavovich, or shall I continue? I think this is a very interesting clinical case. Of course, we all see that we have a patient with a reflux disease. She has erosive aegyphagitis. She has high pH. I have a question. So you will know that uh, the reflux is the result of the increase of the uh, intra-abdominal uh, pressure. She used the PPI. What, what about constipation? After we replaced uh, the drug that was affected her psyche, uh, so we saw the positive effect on the frequency of the stool, defecation, and now this defecation is once a day. It is quite normal. So you would not use any drug specially to remove constipation. You know she received the therapy on uh, excessive bacterial growth, and we used also uh, psychotherapeutic uh, drugs that can affect the uh, maturity of uh, the uh, intestine. Uh, uh, My question is, what type of erosive uh, reflux disease she has? I mean, Los Angeles classification, A to B? A. 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 Okay. And what was the size of hiatal hernia? 1.1 uh, centimeters. Oh, small. Small. So, yeah. okay. Uh, after your treatment, she still uh, has a little hypersensitive esophagus. 
Yeah. And uh, she has some functional complaints also. I think that uh, bloating, is... belching, and so so it's a mixed patient, not clear reflex not, not, uh, esophagitis. Not, not clear re reflex esophagitis, but she has two conditions, and uh, I suppose that uh, it is interesting point that uh, we uh, have to consider different uh, aspects of uh, patients and uh, to uh, try to assess. Uh, every symptom and every possibility. And uh, uh, this approach should be complex uh, to treat uh, such a patient. Yeah. Because a lot of complicated GERD patients have mixed symptoms with dyspepsia, with IBS, sure. some psychiatric disorders. Did you receive any uh, behavior or uh, diet uh, recommendations? Sure. Uh, you, you always explain patients how to eat not to eat before going to bed and things like that. So sure. she received all those uh, behavioral it's, recommendations. Uh, it's our profile because uh, I work in uh, Federal Research Institute of Nutrition and Biotechnology. And so uh, nutrition is uh, the main aspect uh, which we study as researchers. Uh, but uh, in clinical practice, we implement this uh, knowledge uh, to uh, treat our patients. So. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, for gastroesophageal reflux disease, um, uh, dietic recommendation uh, is not so evidence-based uh, because uh, only a uh, low number of studies uh, to support uh, different approaches. Yes, we, uh, we know that uh, smaller size of dishes uh, could be uh, important uh, for uh, uh, for treating and uh, to uh, reach uh, better result in uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. We know that uh, uh, we should uh, avoid uh, some foods, for, for example, fat, uh, fats, uh, fa uh, fatty foods uh, to uh, improve uh, uh, motility and uh, moreover to, uh, uh, to uh, Low esophageal reflux uh, to, for the better function of low esophageal uh, sphincter. And uh, moreover, we have uh, some data about uh, dietary fiber to uh, improve motility and uh, to bind nitric oxide contained in food to uh, uh, achieve better results. In my practice, some patients don't improve after PPI treatment, especially if they have big hiatal hernia and bad habit to go to sleep after, after meals, you know. Mm -hmm. So to advise them not to go to the horizontal position four hours after eating is, in my opinion, very important for them. Mm -hmm. May I have a comment? Sure. Um, it was previously suggested that uh, the PPI refractory got the prevalence is about 30 or, or 40 percent. But recently, for example, an important Italian study have demonstrated that, that the real PPI, the true PPI refractory GERD is not more than, than 20 percent. As you mentioned, uh, again, a functional heartburn, IBS, a functional dyspepsia can, can be uh, mixed, and this is not a true uh, PPI refractory GERD. And also, as you, you mentioned, uh, behavioral therapy uh, and maybe in, in hiatal hernia either surgery or uh, to add the H2 receptor blocker or alginate uh, can, uh, can help. I think we should come to the very beginning and to see with a, a patient with erosive esophagitis uh, that should be diagnosed, uh, but it might not be always there. And but some patients uh, uh, might be on uh, PPIs, but still they complain of some symptoms. And it is important to see whether endoscopy was performed or biopsy was uh, taken, because there are different types of esophagitis that can mimic a GERD. Of course, after having analyzed the medical history of the patients, we can um, draw attention to these two components. But alginates, because uh, weak as, as acid reflux may be even beneficial, and uh, it is uh, a very good indication for alginate uh, therapy. Still, at secretion, and uh, there is mild acid um, uh, secretion in the uh, gastro in the gastro. 
Some patients do respond uh, to uh, PPIs, but in case of a weak uh, acid, acid response, uh, I think alginates can be added into the treatment regimen. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you very much. Uh, we have discussed uh, the problem. In particular, uh, there is one question from the audience. Uh, so you are welcome. It is always about constipation, isn't it? You asked a, a good question, how to improve uh, the functional condition of the bowel. I have my question to Professor Morozov, and it is a very simple question. Perhaps you should have started with uh, normalizing the stool's defecation, because there is a clear overlap a syndrome, the heartburn and the bloating and intro abdominal pressure in a constipated patient that enhances uh, reflux in this case. Of course, of no doubt, the irritable bowel syndrome in accordance with the classical criteria was not seen in this patient. There is no classical pain. Motility was most probably impaired in this patient. And uh, it was important that uh, SIBO uh, overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth in, in the, her intestine was diagnosed because bacteria may add uh, to uh, the patient's condition oligosaccharides and their metabolism, uh, fermentation of uh, the oligosaccharides in the, in, in the intestine may have a negative effect on the uh, sphincter function. And our studies demonstrated if we uh, practice a multidisciplinary approach and if we normalize both motility and other functional conditions of the intestine, including inhibition of secretion and adding some drugs that improves uh, the uh, hypersensitivity, then our patients uh, will improve and we will be success. Um, I think uh, uh, there is some final comment. Diagnose EOE in patients uh, with refractory GERD. Uh, is it frequent diagnosis here in Moscow, EOE, eosinophilic esophagitis? Unfortunately, no. Uh, we have a uh, low number of such patients 